Yo guys, it's Slyro, you already know that today we are back reading some more Danganronpa Zero. Today we are going to be reading chapters 13 and 14. Um, and finally I decided to look ahead and see like how long uh, everything is. And uh, chapters 13 and 14 is not that long. Chapter 15 is not that long. Um, so the, the entire document or whatever is 260 pages long. And chapter 16 starts at like chapter or er, uh, page like 116. Um, which means that chapter 16 is over half of this entire novel. Um, it is split into small sections that I can see, but I'm not showing on screen just for the purposes of, you know, the, the layout and whatnot. Um, so we're going to be able to read chapters 13 and 14 in one video. I'll make chapter 15 a separate video. And then chapter 16 is just going to be split into a bunch. Because if you add up all the time that I've taken to read the first 15 chapters, um, obviously chapter 16 is going to be way longer uh, than one video can dedicate to. So I'll figure out a way to split that up, but we're not wor worrying about that now. We're only worrying about chapters 13 and 14. And uh, yeah, I think there, uh, I don't really know where the story is going to go and what exactly is going to happen. Um, I believe like the, the last chapter sort of ended with, uh, you know, Ryoko trying to just be like, you know what, things are happening, but I'm not involved. And uh, obviously I don't think it's going to exactly happen. So let's go ahead and see what happens uh, for chapter 13 and 14. So you know, sit back, relax, and uh, let's see what uh, this chapter, or these two chapters, which is like five pages long or six pages long, um, has for us. So, let's go ahead. <clears throat> the courtyard at Hope's Peak Academy's eastern quarter deep at night. The lights from the surrounding facilities were long gone. Only the street lamps, installed at fixed intervals, still, daily, still dimly illuminated the darkness. In front of the clock tower on the edge of the courtyard stood a teenage girl alone. She narrowed her eyes and looked at the clock above her head. He should be here soon, she whispered. The girl was waiting for someone. When she first contacted the man, he coldly refused to meet her, insisting that it wasn't necessary. But once she procured documents concerning shady deals in his past, she found him much more open to the suggestion. It wasn't hard after all. She made her livelihood discovering people's secrets. In fact, she thought this one had given up a little too easily. What else was he hiding? Fame is a fickle food. Um, hold on, I, do we know who the he is being talked about here? Alright, no, we don't know yet. Uh, fame is a fickle food. You work so hard to get it, and uh, all it gets you is your freedom lost. The man she was waiting for was a member of Host Peak Academy Steering Committee. Maybe if I just read forward, maybe we'll get the answers to my questions. Um, there was a reason she had to meet a member of the committee. There was something she had to ask directly, whatever the cost. There was a certain truth that the committee was earnestly trying to hide. A truth even her client, Hope Peak Academy's headmaster, most likely did not know. The only avenue of investigation was to question a committee member directly. She had come to that important realization only a few short days after setting out on her investigation. A formidable talent led her to it. Her name was Kyoko Kirigiri. Let's go, Kirigiri! Uh, she was a student at Host Peak Academy 78th class and bore the title of Super High School Level Detective. And right now, she was employed by Host Peak Academy's uh, Host Peak's headmaster to investigate a certain incident. He sure is late, she whispered, looking up at the clock tower once more. Five minutes late. I should have asked him to be strictly on time. The wrinkles on her forehead deepened, uh, but the moment she lowered her eyes from the clock, they disappeared. She saw a figure of a man in the distance. The figure glanced around, seemingly on guard, then proceeded slowly uh, toward where she was standing. Features slowly became clearer. He was an elderly man wearing a pitch black suit and matching and a matching pitch black necktie, uh, as if he was on the way back from a funeral. His grizzled hair was unnaturally stiff with pomade. I don't know what that means, uh, and seemed almost artificial. I assume that's some sort of like hair gel or something. Um, and as the man came closer, his face also revealed itself. His brow was covered with deep wrinkles that seemed to be chiseled directly into his skull. The sunken eyes below them glared at Kyoko with a disgusted expression. The distance between the two narrowed, and finally, when they were only three meters separating them, the man stopped. Was it you who called me here? The man opened his small, straight mouth and raised the question in a severe tone of voice. What is it you want? But his words were cut short. Something absurd, something completely out of place came falling down from the sky. And both the man and his words were flattened by it. What? Uh, okay. Uh, Kyoko felt as if the scene before her was a stop-motion animation. As though she was witnessing a, s a series of ridiculous tableaus. The school desk that came flying down from the sky hit the man directly on the head. A school desk? The man's body twisted from the impact and then collapsed. The desk st struck the ground and then bounced back into the air in recoil. At that point, another desk came flying down from above. It smashed into the fallen man's back, bending his body like a trampled ragdoll. Then yet another falling desk twisted his neck in unnaturally. Uh, the man's face showed no sign of surprise. Uh, it was stuck in the same expression he had when he talked to Kyoko. Several more flying desks hit his body, making a huge cloud of dust uh, as they hit the ground. An overdue intense crashing noise finally registered in Kyoko's ears. 
At the same time, a dust came shooting out from inside the, uh, the cloud of dust, grazed her hair, and landed behind her, revolving like a spinning top. It was a freakish development. Where? Wait, I'm sorry. Where are they meaning that deaths are falling from the sky? Uh, and why are there so many deaths falling from the sky? All right, whatever. Uh, who knows? This is a lot of stuff happening. Okay. Uh, a development with no rhyme or reason. The man who moments ago stood in front of Kyoko had been crushed by a large number of falling school deaths as soon as he opened his mouth. It all took place in the span of a few seconds. Uh, it took Kyoko only a brief moment to regain her senses. The dust cloud was still raising in the air uh, when she took off running up the dust pile. There was already a deep red puddle next to the man who was now buried under the rubble. Dark liquid seeped from his eyes, nose, and ears. Yoko's mind quickly changed course. She turned her head to look above her. A vague silhouette stood atop the school building, slowly coming into focus. It was a human figure illuminated by moonlight from behind. The figure brandished something above its head and then threw it. It was a pipe chair, that, and it was flying straight down towards Kyoko. She jumped aside, dodging the chair's trajectory, and leaped into the school building. Yet another crashing noise came from behind her. She assumed a low posture as she ran through the building's corridors, and then continued to run up the stairs without stopping to catch her breath. At that moment, she didn't care at all if she had just been targeted. She was running purely for the sake of the clue in an adrenaline rush that erased any sense of danger from her mind. Then, in no time at all, she reached the landing uh, at the top floor and found the remains of a padlock lying on the floor in front of the door that led to the roof. The school should really consider bumping up security. Uh, she grabbed the doorknob, muttering cynically. A feeling of cold metal reached her fingertips. She squeezed the knob and pushed. The door opened easily and noiselessly. She immediately felt the strong, cold night wind blowing past her body. She took a single cautious step into the doorway and quickly looked around the roof, dimly illuminated by a starlight. Uh, there was no one there. She walked around the concrete floor, thoroughly checking the area near the door and every other place where a person could conceivably be hiding in the shadows. Nevertheless, she couldn't find anybody. I just miss them. A feeling of despondency assailed her, and she leaned her back on the iron fence surrounding the roof. Then she looked up at the sky and quietly grumbled to herself. So I hate missing person cases. Suddenly, a cold shiver ran past her back. Something wasn't right. She quickly turned over, pushed, pushed her body over the railing, and looked down into the courtyard. Her face caught the cold night wind, and her expression quickly turned grave serious. She could see the wreckage of school desks and pipe chairs near the clock tower, but there was something missing. The body that should have been there wasn't... Man, there's a lot of missing bodies that keep happening, huh? Yoko's teeth chattered from the cold as she pulled her cell phone from an inner pocket. Just as she was about to push the call button, a hint of hesitation appeared on her face. Nevertheless, her finger soon pushed the button. After a couple of rings, she heard a man's voice. Are you free right now? Kyoko asked, skipping a greeting. There's something I want to report directly. I'm coming over. It was a few minutes after uh, Kyoko Kiriyuri had disappeared from the roof. This is a strange sound as if uh, the very air was being torn, echoed through the East Quarters courtyard. Zap, zap, taser gun, uh, exclaimed the high school girl, touted, touting a, a pistol-shaped object high over her head. Her eyes were focused on the two guards lying on the pile on the floor collapsed. They were both lying face down and each had a small, thin needle sticking out of their back. A wire ran from each needle to the pistol in the girl's hand. I take that, uh, she cried and pulled the trigger. The bodies of the two men, uh, who were already unconscious, shook and spasmed along uh, with a violent noise. Haha. <laughs> An ecstatic expression appeared on the girl's face as she watched them. Juko and Ishima. Oh, of course. No surprises there. She had no makeup on. Uh, it looked as if she had just woken up from sleep and kept yawning big yawns. The pistol she held in her hand was a taser gun, a powerful self-defense weapon. It was a type of stun gun. By shooting some target with a needle connected to a wire, she could send an electric current through the target's body. It wasn't originally strong enough to kill a person, but since she'd modified it to send stronger current, it would be so strange if someone did die. A despair-inducing self-defense weapon. One might say it made her unbeatable. Junko Inoshima continued a playing with the taser gun for a short while, but soon grew tired of it. She pulled the wires away with her bare hands and threw them into a plastic bag. Then she nonchalantly dumped the bag into a nearby trash can. Well then, I think that that took care of every annoying person in my way. It seems that little Miss Kindaichi also appeared to who knows where. Poo -poo -poo, does that mean that I have to place all, uh, have the place all to myself? Uh, she let out a theatrical sigh of relief and walked majestically across the plaza. Her destination was the clock tower. She didn't attempt to hide herself at all. Quite the opposite. She exhibited a sense of presence that seemed to scream at people to look at her. It also had the sinister suggestion that by doing so, they might end up dead. That said, I never expected little Miss Conan uh, to stick her nose into my business. It must be that pesky headmaster's meddling. My plans for this scenario don't include her at all, so what am I to do? I mean, it is interesting to have her around, but it's also possible she'll be a real hindrance after I went through all that effort to- Hey, wait, 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 wait! She stopped abruptly as if uh, about to trip forward and stared at the wreckage of school desks and pipe chairs in front of her. The moment she saw it, the cruel smile that was plastered on her face disappeared. Body isn't here, she spat out. Again? 
This shirt is despair inducing, as despair inducing is all your dreams crumbling down. Nevertheless, there was a smile on her face. Finally, she kicked the pipe chair that was lying on the ground near her feet. It didn't seem like a powerful kick, but the chair flew a few meters, hit a street lamp that was in the way, and shot off into the air like a ping pong ball. Then, uh, when the sound of the clashes echo disappeared from the plaza, Junkei Nishimina's figure was already gone, vanished like a shadow. Okay, um, so that's the end of the chapter. Uh, it is pretty quick, and I probably will keep it like that, just because, you know, technically that's two chapters into one, and uh, yeah, it's just going to be easier to, to split up videos that way. Um, but that is very interesting. We're definitely getting just, like, more stuff. Like, Ryoko didn't show up here at all. This is... Yoko was here. Um, there's another man. I guess it was just a chairman. And then, I, I... Yeah, Junko, I assume, was the one that sort of had him killed. Uh, but bodies keep disappearing, so I wonder how that's happening. Something I wanted to bring up, which uh, is really interesting to me. I love that Hope Speak Academy is, like, doing some, like, shady stuff and, like, trying to keep secrets from... A student body that they've literally invited that has like the ultimate talents of everything like you have people like the ultimate detective that are going to find stuff out you have people that are like have ultimate talents that are probably better than yours as administrators and things like that and like you're the ones that are trying to keep secrets by doing like shady things which is very very interesting and uh i i can see very clearly how it did not work out um because when you have a bunch of people with ultimate talents uh you know, they're going to ultimately beat you at, at whatever game you have. Even if the administrators have ultimate talents, I mean, just situationally, some ultimate, ultimate talents are better than others, uh, depending on what you're trying to use them for. So, um, I do find that very interesting and funny. But, uh, yeah, so that was chapters 13 and 14. And uh, we'll read chapter 15 next time, which who knows what is going to happen next. And then, like I said, chapter 16 is incredibly long. Uh, so, chapter 16 is going to be split up into a lot of different videos. So that is the plan moving forward, but we are getting, I don't want to say we're getting towards the end, um, because we are going to need uh, a lot of videos for chapter 16, but uh, I'm looking forward to it, so hopefully y'all are uh, enjoying it as well, and I will see y'all in the next time. So until uh, then, peace out.